uh, but we've also got Mark Pesci here, who um, graduated from MIT in America. Is that correct? No. No? <laughs> Stanford? I was thrown out of MIT in America. Yeah! yeah. Only from there. Okay, that's what they call graduating in America. Um, so yes, yeah, but has since uh, come down to live here in the land of Oz. So uh, Mark Pesci has got a a very special book that is launching here today, and we've got some pre-release copies that some of you might be interested in. And it's called The Next Billion Seconds. And if you count, starting from one to a billion, now, one per second, you'll reach almost 2045, which is very similar to Kurzweil's prediction of the singularity. So I'm very uh, interested to hear what Mark will say will happen in the next billion seconds. So I recommend you all stick around for a those next billion seconds. They should be a blast. should be a lot of fun. So, first of all, I think we have Randell. Oh, no, Mark. Mark, first? Oh. Okay, so first we have Mark. Over to Mark. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, and thank you all for coming out on what I thought was going to be a dark and stormy night, but it's actually a beautifully clear night. This is Melbourne, and the weather changes a lot. So I'm going to read three chapters from the book, and then we can have a little chat. Uh, they're chapters that I didn't pick at random because two of the chapters are very much situated here in Melbourne. And the first chapter actually opens after I gave a talk at Continuum, which is a science fiction convention that happens in town a few years ago. And that talk was actually the beginning of the exploration of the ideas that culminated in the next billion seconds. And it was an opportunity for me to just sort of go through and explore some of those ideas. And as I went through the ideas, well, there's chapter 23. I can't wait to get my implant! Staring at the woman, dumbfounded, realized she wants to be cut open, perhaps behind the ear, with all the delicate electronics that enable connectivity laced into the space underneath her skin, tucked up against her cranium, maybe like an ivy scaling an old brick wall. She wants to link. She wants to think and be connected. She finds this idea irresistible. The only way that I can confront this unexpected lust for the future, rushing to embrace a wave of annihilating change, is with the unvarnished truth. Where's your mobile right now? Here, she says, gesturing at her handbag. And where is it when you go to sleep at night? And it's on the bedstand right next to me. It's my alarm clock. When is your mobile ever more than a meter away from you? She considers this. Well, when I'm in the shower, maybe. That's about it. Why do you need an implant? It's already effectively part of you. What do you gain by putting it inside of you? And she wrestles with this question for a brief moment during which she accepts that she has already arrived at her destination. She already has an implant. Nearly all of us carry our mobiles with us nearly all the time. The vast majority of us sleep next to them, restoring ourselves as they recharge. And we are no longer alone, not even for a moment. And this loss has gone unnoticed. We grow alarmed at the loss of signal, but we seem unable to recognize the absence of a penumbra of quiet, which has always been available to us before hyperconnectivity. We could step away from the world, away from the interruptions and influences of others, away from their thoughts and feelings, and be holy in ourselves. We immediately adapted to the presence of others. We moved from an empty mansion into a noisy hostel without missing a beat. We wear the close connectivity of the tribe as comfortably as an old pair of shoes. The oldest parts of us instinctively understand how to be within relations that endure without interruption. We evolved as creatures 
always within a convenient cooey. Now that call has gone global, restoring everything that was lost in the flowering of civilization. In hyperconnectivity, we have both the anonymity of the mob and the definitive identity of the tribe. We may have no particular location, but we are noticed the moment that we disappear. Emergency services have recently seen a sharp uptick in the number of hikers needing a quick recovery from the bush. Hikers stroll into Australia's substantial parklands, never having bothered to file a route plan with the relevant authorities. And it never occurs to them that they could find themselves many kilometers from the nearest cell tower at the bottom of a ravine lost and needing assistance. Confident in their connectivity, laden with GPS and mobile maps and thinking themselves the equal of any situation, they reach for their mobiles only to find them useless. An encounter, perhaps for the first time, absolute solitude. The connection gives way to silence, and their confidence collapses. Never having been alone, they confront solitude without any of the resilience wrought from prior experience. The same has come true for all of us. This is the sting of hyperconnectivity. We pay the price we pay for being connected is a certain helplessness in its absence. Every time we reach for the mobile, turning to one another for assistance, we lose some innate capacity to confront the world ourselves. And these losses accumulate until, with half a billion seconds left to go, we could only turn back to our prior disconnected selves with great difficulty and enormous resistance. We could choose to repent. Instead, we accelerate toward this new combination of mutual aid and individual weakness. Our actions as individuals become the movements of a global culture. At the end of 2008, when for the first time in history, half of humanity became urban dwelling, half of humanity also owned their own mobile. This is a synchronicity that reveals the alignment of old and new ideas of connectivity. The urban revolution took 10,000 years. The main body of Homo Nexus, connected man, arrived in less than half a billion seconds. Two cultural transformations intersecting in a shared approximation of proximity. The network collapses space to a single point. But like the city, connectivity has a center, it has a boundary, it has areas beyond its reach. As they have always been, cities remain centers of connectivity, with some attention paid to the vast and sprawling suburbs that separate them from the sparsely populated regions beyond. 85% of the human race now lives within range of a mobile signal. That's more than access to clean water. And this coverage represents less than 60% of the Earth's surface. The lore of connectivity has been drawing us together for a hundred centuries. Hyperconnectivity draws a sharp line between the extensive capabilities of Homo Nexus and the rural agrarian humanity that lies outside of signal range. During the next half billion seconds, the boundary will grow more distinct as this new urban form reveals itself in an explosion of capacity. Rural depopulation will accelerate as connectivity becomes irresistible and its absence unimaginable. We will develop techniques to extend connectivity beyond the urban cores, satellite and long wave, subsumed within the preeminent demand for continuous coverage. But the quality of that connection will be inversely proportional to the distance to the hyperconnected center. Some will adapt to life at the margins. Few will embrace that life willingly. We have sur surrendered our singular selves to the communion of others, and we do not mourn the loss.
Everyone hates ticket inspectors. <laughs> Standing beside the turnstiles, they carefully examine every presented chip for validity. And if you somehow fail to pass muster, you'll be called upon to explain yourself. You might end up with an expensive citation, as once happened to me, aboard a Sydney bus where I'd been meant to dip my ticket in twice, but as I'd only dipped it in once, I received a $110 fine. <laughs> now, if you're doing nothing wrong, you have nothing to fear from the ticket inspector, or so the saying goes. Still, so many of us have so little idea of whether we're wholly in the right at any point in time. I mean, I had no idea I had to dip my ticket twice until I got dinged. We tend to avoid close observation. No one is innocent. Everyone has something to hide. Hiding is the natural response. Ticket inspectors know this, and so they place themselves in difficult to avoid positions. They monitor the gates and doorways which shape the flows of the bodies through stations. And as we pass through the checkpoint and see an unlucky few receiving citations, we feel the surge of sympathy there before the face of God. Well, that sympathetic anguish easily bridges the gap of relevance to become a shared moment. It's a warning to all who might follow in our footsteps. My friend Matthew had just such an encounter one day on the tram in Melbourne and posted it to Twitter. Tram inspectors cited on Collins Street at the Spencer Street end. Hashtag public service announcement. <laughs> that self-tagged public service announcement reached quite a number of people, all 1,544 of Matthew's followers on Twitter and the tens of thousands connected to them if they chose to forward that information along. Matthew's casual moment of sharing produced a much broader awareness of the activities of those ticket inspectors whose power of surprise had been thwarted from the moment that Matthew sent his update. Exposed, inspectors can be avoided. Knowing they lie in wait, people will choose different trams, exit through different gates, and avoid the critical gaze. All of this followed from a casual and almost insignificant act, sharing amplified by hyperconnectivity. Now, if those fines had been set terrifically high, thousands of dollars, Melbourne's population of four million would soon be drowning in sightings of ticket inspectors. People would have sufficient motivation to keep those inspectors under very close surveillance. Every sighting would be shared, and every movement would be common knowledge. Attention paid to something is commensurate with its perceived threat or benefit. When a lot of attention gets paid to something, and those observations become broadly shared, it creates situational awareness. Everyone knows as much as needed to keep themselves out of trouble, because everyone is watching for everyone else. When drug-sniffing dogs show up in Sydney's rail stations, many people send warning messages, because the fines and infractions are very severe. Protesters throughout the world use text messaging. Twitter and custom tools like Suki are used to keep track of police movements against protesters. In the London riots of 2011, BlackBerry Messenger was the favorite communication tool of looters who shared information about the most unpoliced areas to rob. Sharing has consequences acts as a force in its own right, and it establishes a zone of influence where other powers, however potent, have difficulties. In a world where everyone, hyper-connected, shares everything of interest with anyone who shares that interest, it has become impossible to operate in secret and beyond view. The possibility of invisibility has been supplanted by a new age of omniscience where anyone can know anything that's happening anywhere, provided they generate sufficient interest in it. 
the secret police have been surrounded and exposed by a hyper-connected polity framing their every movement with a hailstorm of sharing. Everything once hidden is now shouted from the rooftops. And so the surveillance state of Orwell's 1984 has mutated into the surveillance mobs of the Arab Spring, using hyperconnectivity and sharing to build situational awareness and thereby defend themselves against the monopoly on force, which is the prerogative of the state. And even when the technology of those networks falls away, as when Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak shut down all of the nation's mobile and internet providers, even then, the human networks forged in shared moments of sharing persist and strengthen. Technology amplifies and extends, but is not the essence of the network, which remains entirely human. People always find another way to share what they know, from scrawled graffiti, to repurposed billboards, to chains of whispers. There is no censor anywhere when everyone at every point around the censor is fully prepared to share what the censor would withhold. Sun Microsystems co-founder John Gilmore once quipped, quote, networks regard censorship as damage and route around it. The wires and radio waves of the network know nothing of censorship, but the people connected through them draw upon all of their resourcefulness to stay one step ahead of the censor, constantly probing and testing the limits of sharing. When people are sufficiently connected, they will route around the censor, sharing everything of importance, whether media, to the frustration of copyright holders everywhere, or secrets, to the bane of governments, or anything else deemed taboo. Nothing can be kept out of reach in the digital realm. Everything is copied and shared as widely as needed. The age of omniscience confounds power and produces a conservative reaction, which we saw in London yesterday, that seeks to rein in the reach of networks, but which could only be effective if the physical network were the source of the omniscience. It is not. We are. We have learned something new about how to share what we consider important. We distribute it so widely that it becomes a pervasive part of our awareness. Human behavior has changed, wrought by sharing, amplified by hyperconnectivity, and in that change we discover a capacity for universal awareness. Now, I spend a lot of time in the book building up, building up, starting with connectivity and then from connectivity moving into sharing, and from sharing moving into learning. And then I finally get to where I was going which is chapter 45, which is what I'm going to read now. In the beginning, we connect. From the moment we arrive in this world, we seek every opportunity to grow closer to the others that we find within it. We never cease connecting, though we bear the scars of our relations, bound inextricably to every joyous moment. And all of this together frames us, instinct, memory, desire. And once connected, we begin to share. Again, no order need be given. We share because that is who we are as a species. We use our linguistic aptitude to reveal ourselves. We search for common ground, and once found, we explore that ground together. Sharing is the performance of connecting. Until we have shared, we cannot say that we have made as we share with one another, we find that our experience differs. And these points of difference become the highly charged gaps in our knowledge, which suddenly begin to buzz and spark with differential discharges around the gap. We fill ourselves with what others have learned, just as they round out our own understanding. We shock each other 
we add to our potential. The scope of our awareness grows in breadth and in depth. And once again, this happens by itself. No one needs to command us to learn. We move into knowledge because it pleases us, or suits us, or flatters us, and completes us. And none of this is hard. It would be far harder to keep it from happening. We connect, we share, and learn from one another because that's the survival strategy which, over hundreds of thousands of years, kept us alive in hostile environments. Tethered to one another, grateful for the insight of experiences beyond our own, we connect in order to thrive. Half a billion seconds ago, connecting, bounded by proximity, took time and effort. People had to present themselves, and we had to present ourselves to them. This tyranny of distance pruned our connections back to measured and gradual paths. We evolved in this environment, our brains growing large enough to manage connecting with, sharing, and learning from perhaps 150 others, the fabled Dunbar number. Now, there are over 5 billion of us, directly connected. None of us further apart than the time it takes to type a short string of digits. Even the urban revolution did not bring us together like this. Individuals on opposite sides of a great city might never meet. We continuously carry a connection to the greater part of humanity. And the greater part of humanity, likewise, equipped, can connect to us. This is not a conurbation. This is a zero-dimensional humanity. Every point directly connected to every other point because there is only a single point pervasive and unified. Dunbar's number has been amplified and extended beyond any human capacity ever imagined. We have moved from hundreds to billions in a single gesture, a quantum leap which in retrospect will appear nearly instantaneous. We enjoy the curious privilege of being part of this transition. The generations experiencing life before, during, and after the billion seconds which encompass the entire scope of this transition. A billion seconds is sufficient to change everything. We are already connected. The amplification and extension has already happened. An event that lies behind us in our history, a fate accompli. And that may be the most shocking feature of the present moment. We think of ourselves as confidently striding on the ground, only to look down and find ourselves in orbit, and how the hell did we get here? We don't remember the blast of the rocket engines lifting us to the atmosphere. Everything seemed so gradual. We failed to note the gentle but steady tug of acceleration which led inexorably to liftoff and pushed us ever higher. But here we are, far out of our depth, each of us connected, sharing with and learning from five billion others. By itself, this would be among the most remarkable events in human history but past is prologue. We each now have the learning and experience of five billion others to draw upon in this moment. In the mystery of practice, learning becomes knowing. All knowing is doing, and all doing knowing. So we now act with the capacity of five billion. First we connect, then we share, then we learn, and now we do. Each follows ineluctably from the other. Nothing here is anything other than our essential human capacity, a capacity which emerged long before hyperconnectivity a hyperconnectivity which created the fertile grounds for hyperdistribution, 
and hypermimesis, before hyperdistribution and hypermimesis laid the foundations for hyperintelligence. Born equipped for one world, where we leveraged one another's capacities to improve our own, we live in another, where we leverage everyone's capacities everywhere, bringing an inconceivable intensity to our world. Where once we sought the help of others to become fully empowered, we now find ourselves hyper-empowered, catapulted so far from any of the familiar settings of possibility, we have only barely intuited our newly amplified capabilities. This is about to change. In this moment, in the center of the billion seconds of transition between Homo sapiens and Homo nexus, we discover that we can do, that doing follows from connecting, sharing, and learning. We now realize that this is ubiquitously the case, reaching every connected human everywhere. Not only are we all in this together, what we are together is something utterly different. We do not know what we can do. We do not know the limits of the possible or even if there are limits. We are not used to thinking like this. We have no frame for something so sudden and so unfamiliar. In Koweit, we fumble along and do amazing things without any comprehension of the power we now bring to our actions. Innocent as babes and strong as beers, we have the capacity to wreck ourselves with unimagined ease. But we also have the capacity to create at a scale previously inconceivable and to sustain with a scope heretofore unobtainable. With great power comes great responsibility. We need to have a good think about how to use our new powers wisely. And we need to do this right now, for we have already changed beyond recognition. Mm -hmm. Questions? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, the, when information theory was in its early stages, one of the key problems that was identified was the signal-to-noise ratio. Mm. It seems to me that we're at a similar stage in this hyperconnectivity in that there's a very vast amount of noise. The, the solution to this, and this is actually in a chapter in the book, um, is that we in fact are engaging each other as filters. When I signal my interest in something, all of the other people who share that interest notice it and start sending me stuff, and it's already pre-filtered by them. If any of us were trying to comprehend the five billion connected by ourselves, we would explode. You know, the heads would just vaporize and be like that scene from Scanners. Instead, what we have is we have all of the people we're connected to who actually function as the best possible filters. And where they aren't particularly effective filters, we go and find people who are better filters. That's part of the job now, is actually to maintain our connections because our connections are the filters rather than the conduits. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, yes. Uh, so you were talking about uh, how hyperconnectivity routes around censorship in order to um, compete with the state's monopoly over power. Um, but, uh, but in the face of this, I, I, we see that the state will escalate their mm. force. Mm. Uh, where do you see the end game of this uh, escalation? <laughs> the future wears a Guy Fox mask. Mm. Um, mm. The state is engaged in a cat and mouse game with hyper-empowered forces. WikiLeaks is a good example of a hyper-empowered force. What can one or just a few individuals, which really WikiLeaks is just a few individuals, do in terms of destabilizing statecraft is just unbelievable. I mean, the entire Arab Spring can be traced back to a message about Tunisia that was in the decoded cablegrams, da 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 da, right? So it may not be the only cause, but it's certainly one of the causes. So you have this incredibly disproportionate level of influence. The state is using the resources that it's capable of marshalling to bring the problem to closure. And every time it does that, every time it tries to censor, 
the mass of hyperconnected people figure out a way to ride around the sensor. So it doesn't matter whether WikiLeaks, quality, WikiLeaks goes away or stays. I mean, it would be a shame if it went away. But it wouldn't matter because the lesson of what WikiLeaks is has been disseminated through a process of imitation. This is the hypermimesis that I was talking about earlier. Because everyone sees what WikiLeaks is doing and is capable of imitating it or improving upon it because they saw what was happening with it. So what happens is when there is um, a pushback from state power, the entity that it's pushing against is learning. Now this is true in any state of war. In any state of war, the combatants are learning from one another. So what's happening is in any state like this, the hyperconnected mass that's working against it is studying the state power very carefully and trying to figure out ways to route around it. So the question is whether the state in the long run can maintain a presence against that. I'm going to remain silent on that point. <laughs> yes. I think you Mark appreciate it. Thank you for organizing that. We share together knowledge, we share together wisdom, we share together oxygen, we share together light and sun, and we share together water. Why human being nature and desire human being nature want to share together and learn from each other? Why we pay for wisdom or knowledge? We want to come together billion second. Thank you so much. Why do we share? Mm. Um, sharing is at the very essence of what it means to be a successful species. We're the social, we are the most social of all of the hominids. We're probably, depending on whether you want to think about the naked rats as being more social, we're probably the most social of all of the mammals. And the reason social, and I'm not going to give too much away because the first third of my talk tomorrow is actually going to be putting this out in, in a lot of detail. Um, but the, soci the, the sharing and connecting aspects are built into our behavior through the process of natural selection because the more that we're capable of sharing, the more rewarding in terms of the ability to pass your genes on to the next generation you become. So sharing leads to greater reproductive success. And because it leads to greater reproductive success, it has strongly been selected for over a period of time. So the things that started off as behavior start to cross the line between behavior and, and neurology. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, will the frailty of subjective experience ever go away? You're going to have a lot of people agreeing with anything you say, how crazy it is, right? This is, you know, I went to a conference in 2000, uh, the DisinfoCon, and the tagline was, find the others. And the nice thing and the evil thing about the world that we live in is that all subjective experience can now have its own confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. All right? Even the most magical of thinking can have its own confirmation bias. And this is, in fact, I think, going to loom as, it already is looming as one of the great questions, the great paradoxes of connected culture, which is that if I can find people who are going to confirm that global warming doesn't happen, that evolution is a lie, that the sun doesn't light or cheat, right, or that the earth is hollow and there are naked women living in the court who are green-skinned. Yeah, and you can find a cohort that will believe every one of these things. <laughs> I ask you to search Google. <laughs> um, when you can go around and you can get the confirmation bias reinforced by other individuals, you're stuck with this. And there's a chapter in the book, chapter is it 43, Munted? It's chapter 43, Munted, all right, um, in which I basically explore this paradox. The thing about this is that although you can find people who will confirm you in your bias, there are also going to be a lot of people who will try to deconfirm you out of that bias. And so the 21st century is going to look a lot like uh, epistemological warfare. It already does look a bit like epistemological warfare, but it's going to look a lot more like epistemological warfare because groups will have very good tools that we're developing now for sharing and the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of whatever point of view that you might have in order to be able to prove a particular point. One of the things that's very interesting is that um, 30, 35 years ago, the tobacco companies were able to create a cloud of disinformation around whether cigarette smoking caused cancer. Um, the petrochemical companies are not able to do that today because the world is so connected that the manipulations that they're producing have become more transparent. 
So there are forces that work either way, but there are still going to be a number of people who are global warming denialists, not because of anything they've heard from the Koch brothers, but because of whatever. Uh, so it's a, it's a paradox. You know, connected culture makes confirmation bias more possible, but it also makes the, the, the amelioration of that bias easier. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, evolution and wars about ideas, uh, what do you think of uh, Richard Dawkins' idea of a meme? Um, I guess it sort of, how can I put it, it, it sort of subtly influences all of the work. I mean, there's a, there's a concept that's introduced in the book called um, hypermimesis. So, um, mimesis, the Greek word to imitate, which is where Dawkins gets the word meme from. Um, so, what we have now that everyone's connected, of course, is an incredibly good machinery for spreading memes, as anyone who knows who's read the joke that's been repeated a hundred thousand times, or whatever it might be. And so what we have is we have machinery that has been selected for being very good at propagating memes. Is that enough of an answer? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yes. Um, hypothetically, imagine this connectivity becomes a sort of universal tele telepathy, a te universal tele telepathic organism in the science fiction mm -hmm. scenario. But I'm not sure what the difference is in a functional sense between mm -hmm. everyone walking around with a cell phone and telepathy. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the functional sense, yes, what's the difference? Yes, I'm just saying that where if if um, if it's um, uh, well, anyway, that, that's the the science fiction sort of scenario, yeah. sort of um, society slash organism. Now. That organism, though, is still limited by the limitations of its members. And it seems to me that, that one of the limitations of the members is that, they're, um, that they're, there's no suggestion that their own uh, awareness, that their own subjective experience is, is in any way enhanced by this, um, this connectivity. Oh, yeah, no, 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 that's, and, that's absolutely not true. Hang on. Yeah. And also, there's no suggestion that their own limitations in the, in the sense that their sensory and behavioral um, conditioning is any way reduced. Right, exactly. So that's not true either. Okay, right. so let's go through these. Um, two individuals on different continents, all right? And I zap them up a spaceship and put them down, and they've never been on either of these continents before, all right? And one of them has a mobile, and the other one has a all right? <laughs> Who's going to do better in the given situation? The person who is actually capable of being able to reach out for the information they need when they need it. So that person, all things being equal, will consistently be able to outperform because they're well connected. Now, to the degree that they come to draw upon, learn from, and rely upon that knowledge, they will succeed, they will have a greater level of success than an individual who is not connected. So there's no, th th I think, I, I want to make this clear, there's no um, interiority that I need to invoke around this argument. You can actually just say, in a given situation, two individuals, just equip them differently and then watch how they perform. And you'll be able to see that the individual who can perform has a marked difference, difference in performance because they're able to draw upon the connected resource. And I think we can see this now in ourselves. When we have a question that we aren't quite clear on, we will go to Google, we will go to Wikipedia, and we will try to act as much as we can from the information that is, can be brought to hand. Or we will ask friends, where should I go eat dinner tonight? All right, or how do I avoid a ticket inspector? So these are actual real things that are affecting my behavior in the real world. So there's no, there's no interiority around that. It's, it, it's, it's entirely exterior. If I have a certain habit, how is that affected? That's a limitation on behavior, on suggestion. So, okay, so let's say that you're an addicted smoker. Yes. All right? Or, I mean, we, we could do this. I mean, AA is a really, really good example of how this works using a human social network. All right, so AA, and there are equivalents for different types of drug addictions, establishes extremely close social bonds between individuals who are all afflicted by an addiction so that they can reinforce the positive behavior of one in another. So that's a sharing response, all right? And that can happen through a mobile app, through a connected community. There are ways of being able to do that. But those, we already have strong examples of how those work in the real world that will be, can be brought over and amplified by hyperconnectivity. 
Will they be better than the ones we have in the real world? I you suppose that's the question. You've only got so many hours in a day. If you spend it on a mobile, you're not going to be doing, you're not going to be meditating. You can't you, you can't have both. Oh, I, there's absolutely there's a trade-off there. Absolutely, there's a trade-off between the space. And I mean, that's exactly where I started off in, in the chapter around this um, not acknowledgement of the loss of silence. All right, there's absolutely a place for silence. Chapter 24 is my call very clearly for the fact that we actually need a time to be disconnected, that disconnected time has value. The problem being that we lived all of our lives in the disconnected world, and now we're in the connected world, and we've forgotten that the disconnected world has value. Well, we're going to have to recover that, and I completely agree with you on that. We just have one more question, and we're all I guess that, that's you, because you're hand up. Do you think that living in a more hyper-connected world could lead to greater feelings of alienation? Like the saying goes, so many Facebook friends, yet possibly so little friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I know it. Um, I don't know that any of us have a really good answer for that yet. Sherry Turkle has written very eloquently around this in Alone Together because people will sometimes select for the virtual connection because it is easier to manage than the messy real world connections. And I suppose that that's part of the allure and the danger of hyperconnectivity. But I don't think that hyperconnectivity actually makes things that much easier. God knows the number of times I get pissed off with Twitter. <laughs> I know for a fact that it doesn't do that. But it does make it manageable. And real, the real world is not manageable to the same degree. So I think that that is part of the temptation of hyperconnectivity, is that it can be reductive in the sense that it would produce easily managed situations. I wonder if that will be persistent in the case, or whether that's simply the fact that we're only just kind of okay at it. But we've probably all gotten a text message that broke our heart. So it's not as simple as that, is it? Thank you. Uh, thank you.